Alright, next in line is our second game in the Legends series, and we're already in spin-off territory. A prequel spin-off at that, and unsurprisingly, the center of attention for this one is the Bond family. These guys ended up being one of my favorite elements of Legends 1, and given that the misadventures of Tron Bond is even a thing, it's a safe assumption that was the consensus for fans back then too. Though according to a Capcom representative at the time, it was also because the first Legends game was considered popular enough to warrant this, though I do wonder about that bit. I think back to what I said in the Legends 1 video where I didn't recall Capcom pushing any sort of commercials for Mega Man Legends. I can't even exactly recall the, the gaming magazine I saw Mega Man Legends coverage in. If I'm just not misremembering that bit outright, the late 90s were 30 years ago after all. But I've been seeing and hearing from you guys that apparently Capcom didn't really push Mega Man Legends in advertisements. If I could take a guess as to why, they were wrapped up in the Resident Evil franchise, which was exploding in popularity around this time, so Mega Man Legends, eh, if it sells, it sells. But I'm not even sure how well the first Legends game did sales-wise in the first place, and I couldn't find any concrete numbers with an ironclad source. Obviously, it did well enough to get two other games, but I can't help but wonder how much of that was because just enough people played it, or simply because there was just enough Mega Man fans that gave it a go because of the series' legacy. Like to all Mega Man fans my age, like mid-30s and shit like that, when Legends was current, do you recall how you first got your hands on this game? Do you remember how you learned about it? I would love to hear about that. But the misadventures of Tron Bond puts the spotlight on Tron, the mechanical whiz that has a bunch of surf bots under her command that she also considers her children, but at first, the story doesn't begin with her, but rather her older brother Teasel. During an excursion to look for treasure, Teasel ends up clashing with this dude named Glide, who is there to collect the debt that Teasel owes to Lex Loathe, a loan shark with interest rates that will make an American college blush. Being unable to pay for it, or more like Teasel doesn't want to pay it back because just look at this guy, Teasel and Bon Bon end up being kidnapped and held for ransom, leaving Tron and her surf bots aboard their large airship the Gessel Shaft to find some way to accumulate enough money to pay back Lex Loathe. But because the Bond family are sky pirates, Tron is not going to earn the money by working your standard 9 to 5 or through a GoFundMe, she's going to rob the shit out of people, and that's the name of the game. It's up to Tron, Bond, and her surf boss to ransack the fuck out of Ryship Island using her giant mech the Gustav to rob banks, explore ruins, steal cargo, capture livestock, all to eventually amass enough funds to get Teasel out of his debt. But the misadventures of Tronbon isn't quite the standard Legends game. A couple of times you'll be playing missions like you did before, but no, this game is like a collection of mini games. Your end goal is to reach 1 million zenny. Well, at first, because once you do reach it, Lex Sloth pulls that piece of the hut bullshit and ups the ransom to 2 million zenny, forcing Tron to get back out there and do more missions. But because payouts for missions can be so high, especially as you do more difficult levels, which have even higher payouts, you'll find yourself drowning in Zenny very quickly. So what this means is that you have a large amount of wiggle room with your earnings, giving you freedom on how you ultimately want to approach the end goal. If you don't care about spending Zenny to upgrade your mech's health or weapons, I think you can skip about half of this game's missions. I mean, good luck with that. Some enemies can be a real pain in the dick without the energy to tank their hits. But depending on your route, this game could take about eight hours or just over three. If you don't feel like playing a puzzle game with stolen cargo, you can just go to the ruins and fuck up your surf bots for the greater good. But seeing as I had every intention of playing every mission anyway, and because there's nothing that makes me happier than having a lot of money, video game or otherwise, this is sort of a moot point. But I like the openness of the game's structure. I value when a game lets players choose how they want to go about things. I gotta be real though, this game did scare the shit out of me at first because I thought it was going to be front loaded with a bunch of micromanagement. So alright, once the control with Teasel is done, right, and you have control of Tron, you go back to HQ the Gessel Shaft. This place acts as your hub between missions, and the more missions you do, the more rooms you get to explore, like your own personal rooms or the engine room. But HQ is also where you keep tabs on your surf bots. These are Tron's minions, for lack of a better description. But she also considers them her children, being her personal creations, and because, well, they have the mannerisms of children. Extremely competent children, granted, they do run the airship when you're not around, and they help with mission control, cook meals in the kitchen, they can scout different parts of the island to give you extra items to sell, shit, they can even gamble in casinos when you're not even looking at them. They can do a lot of things when they put their mind to it, and still remain oh so adorable, despite extremely hazardous working conditions. By giving them certain items you find in missions or by talking to them enough times, they can even help you develop new weapons and upgrades for your mech, like a big bazooka or gatling gun for firepower, different paint jobs, and a surplus of armor and health upgrades. And if you manage to get all of these, you're virtually indestructible by endgame, I'm not kidding. But check this list, there's over 40 of these sons of bitches, and most of them not only have a special skill that makes them excel in one area of expertise over the other, but they all have an attack stat for damage, a speed stat for maneuverability, an intelligence stat for effectiveness, and a 
sloth stat. More on that in a second. I thought at first this was gonna be the bulk of the game. Micromanaging the serve bots, like I'm talking Tamagotchi on fucking steroids. This was the late 90s, early 2000s, and those were immensely popular around this time. Maybe that was the idea behind this. But as it turns out, managing serve bots is not that big of a deal. All those stats I mentioned, those just naturally go up if you just bring surf bots with you on missions. And I found the difference between a surf bot with minimum stats and one with higher stats to be negligible in casual play. If you unlock their special skills, then that can make quite a difference out in the field. Some can throw grenades to make long range combat easier, or even hold an enemy in place for you to smack the shit out of them. But at the end of the day, it's Tron and her Gustav that does all the heavy lifting, literally in some cases. So managing the serve bots is only really there to give folks that like to min-max their stats something to burn time on. And thank God for that, because I wasn't sure if I was ready to raise 40 of these fucking things. I got other shit to do. That sloth stat though, let's talk about that. If you don't take serve bots with you on missions, they get lazy and don't do anything. And in order to lower it back down to set them straight, you gotta take them to the torture room. Good fucking God, why is this here? But Tron's method of discipline goes beyond a simple belt or chancla. No, she skewers them with spikes, sets them on fire, and crushes them with a 10 ton weight. You remember that old proverb, spare the rod, spoil the child? No, fuck that, Tron's like all the rods. And these poor little shits get put through the ringer. What the fuck? Servbots are indestructible, it should be pointed out, but they can still feel Tron. I'm just saying one day these kids are gonna realize they outnumber you 40 to one and that the revolution is gonna be a bloody one. Mark my words. But no, I don't think that'll ever happen. These kids really do love Tron and always try their best even if they have no fucking clue what they're doing at times. The interactions between Tron and her serve bots always delivers on being heartwarming and genuinely funny. This game has some great dialogue during downtime, like whenever you start talking with your serve bots, and there's a lot of comedic bits and physical slapstick that put a smile on my face throughout. So far, the Legends games are two for two with character interactions, and I'm hoping they can go for that proverbial turkey. A side note though, I think it was a missed opportunity to not give Tron a different set of sprites for each room she visits inside the Gessel Chef, you know, a reaction to her current environment, and I only say that because she does have a different idle animation for when she's on the deck, and I know, it's not much, but I like that attention to detail. And then there's the laboratory, where she's entirely decked out in research attire. And I love this look, I really get the feeling that in this place specifically, she's truly in her craft. I gotta wonder how the fuck she sees out of these things. But I love how the game goes out of its way to highlight how seriously she takes building things. I just would have liked that this detail extended beyond two rooms, you know? Anyway, after you wrap up doing whatever it is you gotta do in HQ, it's time to set off and earn some money. And in this game, instead of the 3D Metroidvania approach, you have stages that you just select on the map. Only four missions to select from at first, but after amassing enough money, you'll get access to all six missions available. And each mission bearing the fourth one also have three different difficulties containing new challenges, but also earning you much more money for completing them. So in essence, every mission has three stages. How you go about it is largely up to you. You can do a single level a piece from each mission to spice things up, or you can just be like me and brute force through everything one mission at a time because I'm a content creator forever cursed with comments that say I forgot to talk about such and 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 such. That said, first up is mission one. We gotta rob this bank. But for the first two levels, your surf bots keep dropping you off near the animal hospital instead. And I gotta wonder, Tron, just manually steer the ship yourself so you don't have to keep worrying about this. But okay, this mission is all about looting. And you can loot practically everything. Blast open doors to houses and send your minions inside to steal all of their money and delicious curry. Got the police on your tail? Tell your surf bots to strip the car of their parts and then blow them the fuck up. Pedestrians in your way? Light them up. Non lethally, of course. The bonds are pirates, not monsters. It's Mega Man Legends with no sense of morals, and that's just about what I expect from the Bond family. It's a pity that the controls are about the same as before, so movement is still a little rough, and your mech doesn't get nearly the amount of tools and weapons that Volna could use previously. You eventually get a bazooka, which is needed to blast open a certain wall uh, one time, I think, and you also get a Gatling gun, which I ended up really liking. That damage output was not at all bad. But other than that, you just got your basic blaster with horn properties and your surf bots, who you can send out to either rummage for treasure or sick on enemies to either distract them or hold them down, leaving them open to attack. Bottom line, however, you end up not doing as much as you would in the first Legends games. The enemy variety isn't big, and areas tend not to be very large either. No, levels are straightforward here, you'll be done in no time. But you know, I like to think of it as short, but sweet. Because sending your serve boss to rob things always felt good, and given the law, a good kick in the ass was pretty gratifying. When you eventually reach the bank, you encounter this police officer named Denise, and at first, you're supposed to think nothing of her. I mean, she woke up late to her shift, she seems pretty clumsy altogether, a real down-on-her-luck type of girl, and Tron is quick to see that and mock her for it. 
But then you fight her, and despite her tiny frame, she fucking judo tosses your ass while you're still in the mech. Holy shit, that took me by surprise. Why isn't this woman the chief of police? But you take her down, you rob the bank, the money is yours, good luck with that paperwork, Denise. I would seriously consider a career change to fucking wrestling, though. Your skills are very wasted here. Off to the next mission. I'm gonna go ahead and lump mission two and six together, since they're basically the same thing. It's time to steal some cargo for your home base. I'm talking beef steaks, crab meat, televisions, and coffee. All the essentials a pirate might need, especially the coffee. It's like going to Sam's Club, these boxes are so fucking big. Eh, that should last me about a week, I got problems. But these are puzzle stages, because the goal is to grab the supplies and put them in your boat in not only a certain amount of steps, but also in a certain amount of lifts. If you go over the determined limit, you can't grab any more boxes and you gotta start over. There are also obstacles to deal with, like steel crates that you can only shift around in place and conveyor belts that might impede progress. This game is just a matter of using logic and planning a route to get all the boxes and the number of moves given. In the case of Mission 6, you also need to use your surf bot to drive a forklift to get boxes you can't carry far enough on your own. And just a heads up, make sure the surf bot is actually in the forklift before you start going about your merry way, because you don't want to find yourself getting your route all good to go, only to realize mid-lift that you forgot to send your surf bot to drive the forklift, causing a reset. I don't get why they did this either, it's not as if you can solve these puzzles without the forklift. I don't think so anyway. So it just seemed like an unnecessary step. A good brain teaser, but I didn't think much of this, besides the music being a good head bopper. Ended up being some of my favorite tracks in the game, it had a real 80s vibe to it. The synthesized percussion being a dead ringer for that era. What are you doing? All right, mission three, RPG, yeah, you know me. Time for some cave dwelling in search of treasure, but since these passageways are pretty small, you can't take the Gustav with you, so you gotta deploy the Finkel. Equipped with beacon bombs for Serbot commands, a lunge attack for self-defense, and a bird call for when you wanna grab someone's attention. I don't know why we have this looking back. You can just talk to anyone you come across without having to do this. And this was the best noise the Finkel could do. I would've used a different sound. Ah! So this is basically a throwback to those old school first person dungeon crawlers, but the gameplay loop is very brain dead. Every obstacle is solved in almost the exact same way. You get your serve bot to flick a switch, or you turn it off, you get them to break a wall. This is 90% of the gameplay, I'm not kidding, outside of some very basic combat. It doesn't ask for much besides you ramming your robot into things. And this is if your serve bot already didn't do the job. And then there's this random game with 10 questions with these kids. You talk with some NPCs for some flavor text, there's nothing wrong with that. Shout out to my man Dance who has a good heart but gets his shit rocked multiple times because of his clumsiness. Look at his face there, like he just lost a round of Street Fighter. Other than that, you're just opening treasure chests, which either have things to sell back at home, or a key card needed to explore more of the ruins, where you're just repeating the things you already did. You're also occasionally saving people in need of help, and I gotta question Tron's sense of morals sometimes. Miss Tron, look! She gave us a game key! That's nice! See? It's good to help people when they're in trouble, isn't it? Too true, Tron, but fuck those people we robbed in the first mission, am I right? Maybe it's an anti-authority thing. The end of every level has boss fights against giant reaver bots, and these are fine, my favorite part of the mission, really, if only because, you know, they were the most exciting thing happening on the screen. Again, the RPG mission is just too simple for my taste. I'm getting the feeling that this game, with the emphasis on comedy, the childlike surf bots, the lighthearted writing in general, this game was probably designed for a younger demographic. I'm not talking like preschoolers, but like just past elementary school and the like. I don't know why Hey You Pikachu was on my mind constantly during these parts. This gave me very similar vibes. Easy money, but easy to zone out. You also might have noticed that I haven't been going into much of the story, and that's because besides the opening with Teasel, once Tron makes it her mission to help her brother out, that's really it for the overarching narrative. All the missions you do don't really push the story anywhere, the flavor text just serves to flesh out the Bond family as characters, how tightly knit they are as a family. And you know what, I didn't really mind that, I enjoy what's given to me. But for the plot, you're just here to plunder, make some money, and then go about your business. Once you reach the 1 million zenny threshold, you meet Lex Low face to face who does his loan shark bullshit and asks for 2 million zenny instead. But that's really it though, no real development of anything else, other than learning that Lex is cooking up something behind the scenes, you're just not sure what that is yet. So until then, you just keep doing missions until you reach the new quota, and then it's time for Endgame. All right, mission four, The Ruins. This is the closest the game gets to the first Legends title, as you're exploring ruins in the Gustav, seeking out treasure, opening new passageways, and blasting any reaver bot in your way, and they love throwing these fucking things at you. Oh my god, change it up, guys. This is also the only mission that doesn't have different difficulties or levels. It's one giant area, and what you get out of this all depends on how much you decide to explore. If you go all the way and beat the boss, you do end up finding that treasure that Teaser was looking for originally, Diana's Tear, and that shit is worth a million zenny alone. If only Glide didn't interrupt Teaser beforehand, could have made a cool million zenny and then he could kidnap Teasel. Idiot. 
These ruins don't get as complex as the subgates from Legends 1. Like the tunnels you explore in the RPG section, they're straightforward and don't require much brain power either. You just go around, shoot things, and get your serve boss to check out these glory holes. Legends fans will probably enjoy these the most, but I consider them watered down from previously. And that just leaves Mission 5 action. Stealing cargo from shipyards wasn't enough. It's time to raid the farm's livestock. Pigs, cows, horses, they're all here. And man, I didn't like this one. Okay, I didn't like the last level where you wrangle up horses. The first two levels, they were simple enough. You gotta get a certain number of pigs and cows into your truck. You do this just by sending your serve boss to the animal proper and then protect them from harm as they carry the livestock back to the truck. Nothing much to it, nothing complicated about that, but the horses in level three just wanna be fucking extra and require more finesse to capture before they can be sent to the truck. And folks, I don't know if there was a trick to this because this shit just felt like RNG. Your serve bots can't capture the horse by themselves. You have to physically get up in their face and make them stumble before the serve bots can mount them. But even this doesn't guarantee capture and I honestly don't know how to make this easier. It's it related to the serve bot stats. The ones I took with me had decent numbers all around. What the fuck's happening here? It just felt like I was waiting for the game to take mercy on me. All while I'm shooting down endlessly respawning robots and a pissed off farmer that keeps attacking my truck. Get away from my kids, you prick. Jesus, he acts like he never had his animal stolen before. I'm coming back tomorrow to do this shit again, Bob. Count the fucking minutes. But that's that. That's all the missions. Whether you do them all or only a handful, as soon as you reach the quota, you're automatically sent to the end game. So it's up to you. Do you make a beeline to end game, achieving the bare minimum just to get there? Or do you spend that extra money to buy upgrades for your mech to make future missions easier? Personally, I did the latter, not just because of this video, but I quickly realized, wow, you make a lot of money very quickly in this game. So even though at a few points I was very close to reaching the threshold, just doing one more mission will send me to the next point of the story. I didn't hesitate to blow it all on an armor upgrade or a new gun because I was pretty sure I was gonna make all that money back and then some by the end of the next mission, and that's exactly what happened. I was decked to the nines by endgame. My armor was nigh impenetrable and I had a shitload of E-tanks to refill my health. The final boss was no challenge at all. I was nowhere close to dying. The end game is pretty cute though. After getting the two million zenny, Lex Loth and Glide end up kidnapping Tron anyway and lock her away with Tizo and Bond. Lex Lowe's ultimate plan is to use the diggers he kidnapped to excavate this ginormous reaver bot called the Colossus and use its power to conquer the world. And I gotta tell you, I really hate saying the word digger, but th <laughs> thanks to Tron Surf Boss taking command like the alpha chads they are, they pilot the Gustavs themselves managing to free the bonds from imprisonment and destroy the Colossus in one last epic battle. All the dialogue during this between the Bonds and the Serbots, it's all great stuff. It's more of the reason why I fell in love with them in the first game. Even Denise, the police girl, is throwing a bone here, and she's given all the credit for throwing Lex and Glide in prison. Well, that was nice with Tron, but that's still a shitload of paperwork for Denise, so, you know, who's really laughing? I'm telling you, Denise, pro wrestling, it's your calling. So, I like this game. I'm glad to have spent more time with the Bonds, but I don't see the harm in skipping this. The mission structure reminded me a lot of classic Mega Man, and some of these I had a good amount of fun with but the game never picks up, leading it to feel pretty mindless not too long in. You can get some additional mileage if you really care about micromanaging the serve bots, but this isn't really needed just to complete the game. It's just something you do for optimization and downtime. You know, maybe fuck around with your pocket station if you're playing the Japanese version. What the hell is that thing anyway? Is it like the Dreamcast VMU? The Misadventures of Tron and Bond is an appetizer for things to come, but without having the sustenance of a main course. It feels it was meant to pass the time until Mega Man Legends 2 was good to go. The physical game actually came with a demo of the second Legends game, so I think even Capcom knew this wouldn't have the same appeal for some, so let's give them a reason to guarantee their purchase, you know, fuck. That's the whole reason why they bundled the Final Fantasy VIII demo with Brave Friends and Musashi. That was a good game, goddammit. It deserves more respect than that. All right, one more Mega Man video left in the docket before I move on to other things, and this is Mega Man Legends 2 we're talking about here, and I, I've certainly heard things from fans throughout the years about this game, at uh, certain points of the game anyway, but I know next to nothing about it as a game, so can the Legend series go three for three? I don't, I've been really enjoying myself so far with this, so uh, it remains to be seen. Uh, as for patron shoutouts, uh, thanks to you guys and your feedback over at the Patreon, uh, I'm now going to just strictly leave Patreon shoutouts to the end of the video, but I'm just going to say a lot more names to make up for it because I was thinking about like having Patreon shoutouts in the beginning and end of the video, but I noticed like, especially for like YouTube videos, if I had the sponsor on top of that and I got Patreon shoutouts in the beginning of that and the intro, it takes a while for me to get the video going, doesn't it? So I figured, you know what, let's just uh, add more Patreon shoutouts towards the end of the video and just get more names right there. That said, we got some Patreon shoutouts. All right, so shout out to some of my $10 patrons here. And again, I do apologize if I butcher some names. Michael Alemo Dibby, Lassie Crow Larson, now to a place, Mr. Spaghetti, Alex James, Jordan Colin, Fox Bateman, Simmel, Gate 653, Obsidian Dynamite, Alan! 
Carbon Eden, Mosby Dick, Jake Clark, Jack Clark, sorry, Metal J Rock 2299, David Perez, Allen 501, Whoa Meatball, Daniel Holmes, Shiny Umbrian, Foxy Hex, Mental Meta Dale, Jean John Juan, Tra JC, I know that's you, KJR, whatever, Glass Vasca, Jamie Dosdale, Jake, uh, Carrie Renee Rose, Matt Hop, Tyler Nocturne, Crimson DX, Ellie Fenker, Faded, Mediocre Panda, uh, your words, not mine, The Nerd King, CJ Mergle Merlinton, Sil Jeff, Sino ZX, Breakfast and Stuff, The Animation Analyst, uh, Daniel Jose Davies, Audi Ambestro, Fundaga Mage, Austin Anton, EC Rep, Oro Money, Hunter Bear 97, Jubris, Noah Munro, Mr. Chaos, General Williams, Heroes Rise Up, uh, Kane, Rondo the Game Guy, Sam Procrastinates, uh, hey Sam, uh, Michael Kelly, uh, Tur Turianator, Mr. Rainbow Tie, Mr. Kryptonite, no, my Kryptonite, sorry, Jimmy, David Ellis, Smiling Dread 04, Pokey Samus 217, and finally for today, El Tech, no, Technopata, El Technopata, <laughs> I don't know, man, I, you guys have some very interesting names, uh, so, as always, thank you so much uh, for subscribing to the Patreon, and uh, as always, thank you all for watching, take care of yourselves and each other, have yourselves a fantastic night, and take care.